we've been looking at, last week we've been, we looked at the story of Sarah and Abraham and Sarah and Abraham's purchase of that cave in Machpelah. And today we're going to continue looking at the journey that almost gets to Bethlehem. But my question for you today is, did you come to church today with expectancy? Now, I normally don't tout things that I do, especially sermons that I preach, because I struggle to think that there are any good. But I'm not saying it's good. It's just a chance I can plug the app. Um, (laughs) If you don't know what I'm talking about, the difference between expectation and expectancy, you could go to our awesome app and go to the media content, the current sermons, and in there you will find a sermon entitled, Go Tell John living a life of expectancy or something like that. Um, And you could watch or listen to that and understand what I'm talking about. But today I want to talk about looking again, just kind of being expectant, being having an expectancy of life. And this year, um, Pastor Walt found a video that we decided we were going to play every week leading up to Christmas. And we're going to look at that again. And if you didn't see it, it's a pretty, pretty fun, humorous little look at just the joys of living expectancy and just being happy for everything. Let's see that now. I'm alive! Yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah! Uh, hey, Christine, you're here too. I love you. I know. Dad, what's happening? Honey, the power works. It's coming. It goes on and off. Whatever we want. <laughs> We've got clean water. Oh, that's great. Look at that. Ooh. I bet I know what this does. Rain down the glorious water. Ha. <laughs> Shoes. Oh, what do we got here, guys? I love food. What? A beef have work? This is awesome. Look, look at here. These? The what? Jack, be careful. Oh. I have a car. Did you guys see this? Yeah, you have a car. Oh, a car! <laughs> and don't forget your coffee. You're the best. There are gifts all around us, I think, that sometimes we just forget to acknowledge. And one of them, I think, is just kind of explained in just living a life of expectancy. Today, we're going to look at uh, the continuing looking at the Almost to Bethlehem story, looking at a sermon today entitled Almost There, When Jesus Moves Past Our Failures. And so as we begin today, I just want to ask, as you open your Bibles today, which for some reason, somehow I got up onto the platform today without mine, it's okay, we will will make do. But as you open your Bibles, either in your um, devices or in your, in the actual physical paper Bible, do you have that joy of like, (gasps) we're opening the Word of God And we're going to be expectant. We're having expectancy that we're going to see something from God today. I believe that's going to happen. But as we look at how Jesus moves us past our failures, almost there, the question kind of is, is do do we have expectancy in our failures? In those moments when it feels like everything is crashing around us, do we have expectancy that even then Jesus will be there. It's easy when things are good, but when we're living a life of expectancy, God's word, God's promise is is that he's going to be there in the storm, outside of the storm. And whenever there's a storm, you can trust that Jesus has already gone through. And so today we're gonna look at the story of Jacob. Jacob is the grandson of Abraham and Sarah, the 
namesake to the chosen people of God. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. And he is, he is the father, the namesake to the tribe, to the nation of Israel, the father to the tribes of Israel. This is kind of an important person. And we're going to look at an amazing journey that he took. It's found in Genesis chapter 35, verses 16 to 20. I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Genesis. If you're unfamiliar, it's the very first book, so it's easy to find. Um, And you can just pop right in there and find chapter 35, verse 16, and that's where we will begin today. And this is what the Bible says happened to Jacob. They were traveling from Bethel to Hebron. Traveling from Bethel to Hebron. And on this journey, that journey is about a two-day journey. I, I was in the back and couldn't see Pastor Walt. I guess he held his hand up. How, how long was the journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem? About five days. About five days. All right, perfect. So this would, um, Bethel was a lot closer to Bethle- Bethlehem, and Hebron was just about another day beyond that. Um, so they were traveling to Hebron, and here's what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 35. As they're on this road traveling, then they moved from Bethel. While they were still some distance from Ephrath, which is also another name for Bethlehem, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. As she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, don't despair, you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying. She named her son Ben-Oni, which means son of my sorrows or son of my despair. But Benjamin, or but the father, Jacob, named him Benjamin, which means son of my, my strength or my right arm. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. Over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar, and to this day, that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. That is, that's a bad trip. Okay, that, that is, that is a, a journey that I wouldn't want to recall very often. But here we are looking at Jacob's journey from Bethel to Hebron, while they were almost to Ephrath. The Bible is kind of clear, and I think what, I've, what I draw out of this text is just that, the concept, that while they were still a ways off, while they were almost to Bethlehem, to Ephrath, I just imagine, if you will, jump into the white spaces of the Bible, outside of the black letters that tell us exactly what happened and use our imaginations, I imagine this was like any other trip we might experience today. Except for there were 11 sons and who knows if they had wives and grandchildren already and servants. We know there's at least one midwife going along on this trip. And here they are, Jacob is driving the caravan. He's up on the horses, up in the front seat of the wagon, wherever it is that he's sitting, he is driving the, the wagon and they are working hard to get to where they're going. I imagine Joseph is probably about 15 years old, so maybe Joseph, but maybe if some of his older kids, older brothers had grandsons, or maybe if Joseph was like me at 15, he's asking that classic question. Are we there yet? <laughs> and the, and the, my answer to all of that is like, Well, yes, we're there. If there is here, then we're there because we're here. (laughs) That's why I have no kids because I would just destroy their minds. Anyway, um, so watch out as you let me interact with yours. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) Anyway, so I imagine the, the questions were coming. Are we there yet? And on this trip, and I don't know if they started out this trip with Rachel and labor, it seems kind of silly if they did. I would have to question Jacob's um, thought process there. 
But sometimes when God calls you to move, you just move no matter what's happening in your life. And they're moving on this trip. And I just, I can picture in my mind Rachel beginning to have labor. And the, and the joy going through the, the caravan as they are like, oh, the baby's coming, the baby's coming. And Jacob, being, the, being a, a man, is like, okay, we're going to get there. And not only, I don't know where, where, where this was happening, but he's like, no, honey, we're not stopping in Jerusalem. There's too much traffic there, too many people. We're going to get distracted. You may want to shop. I don't know what the deal is going to be, but we're going to push right past Jerusalem, and we're going to keep going. Kind of like that. We, we can make it just a little bit further. And here he is up driving, trying to get to where he's going. And while they're still a ways off, things begin to, begin to change. Maybe Ephrath was that perfect town where you could go find a room at the inn. Known for kind of its hospitality later, Bethlehem means house of bread. Maybe this was just a good watering post kind of a town, a good town to stop in, good inns, nice people there, lots of water, a nice well, fresh well there, house of bread, tons of things to do, um, just all the sustenance you would need for a family of this size. And we can push on just a little bit further, hold on. But Rachel, it begins to, to turn. The joy begins to turn because it's becoming clear that this, this pregnancy is not going well. It's not going well. The cries of moms having a baby are, are turning to moms having a baby, but she's not doing well. And the sorrow begins to kick in. I imagine that Jacob is torn at this point, torn between driving the caravan and getting to where they're trying to go, of, of moving his family along. He is the man of this family, and he is following God, and they are moving down the road. They are moving to a point, and he is going to get them there, and he knows if he just presses on, drives the horses a little faster, pushes the family, does not take as many bathroom breaks, keeps moving on that they can get there in time. Just hold on, Rachel. We're almost there. Hold on. We're almost there. Jacob is torn between the progress and the love of his life. The woman that he spent 14 years working to get, 14 years working to earn the right to call her his wife, the woman that he saw on that day when it just was like, I'm going to marry her and it's going to be soon. And Jacob works for seven years to achieve that and then is kind of tricked so that the family isn't disgraced by the younger daughter getting married first and gets married to Leah and doesn't realize it. And let's just not think that through too much. I don't care to know, but it, it just is. I'm glad that's not how it happens to me or in any of us today. That's what I have to say about that. And so moving on, he spends seven more years working to get this. This is the love of his life the woman that he has wanted to have children with, but then can't. But then does and has Joseph, his most favorite. This is the love of his life. And she is in the back of the wagon dying, but they're almost there. I try to wrap my mind around what happens next because it seems strange. The Bible said, with her dying breath, just one more push, just one more breath, she gives birth to Benjamin. 
And after she's told not to despair, she names her son child of my sorrow. There is, there is some stuff we can unpack there. Not letting the circumstances get the best of us. But here she is at this moment giving birth, son of my sorrow. And she breathes her last. And Benjamin, Benjamin Jacob is like, no, this is son of my strength. And I bet he's not thinking of my strength. I bet he's thinking of strength that comes from somebody more powerful than he is. But here they are on the side of the road where Benjamin is born and Rachel dies. And the Bible says that they buried her right there on the side of the road. We've all seen those kind of memorials on the sides of roads today, crosses, flowers. Um, it's been maybe seven years, but I remember I was driving out to go fishing out in the mountain somewhere, and there's a sharp corner, and there's this family creating a little memorial. And as I drove by, I mean, I was just filled with emotion, just thinking of what probably happened. You could just see what happened at a sharp corner, just imagining that they were, had lost somebody there, seeing what they were doing, the emotion, and they set that memorial up to remind them. The Bible says that they piled up these stones, these pillars, these stones of remembrance, these Ebenezer stones. And Jacob puts the last one on top, which is why today if you still go to Israel, over all the tombs you'll see rocks on top of them, hearkening back to what Jacob did with Rachel. But right there on the side of the road, not in the cave at Machpelah, where his grandma and grandpa are buried, Abraham and Sarah. Not in the cave where his mother and father are buried, Isaac and Rebekah. Not in the cave where he later lays his second wife, his first wife, Leah, second in, second in status, but first in chronology. Not in that cave he buries her right there on the side of the road. I'll never forget when my grandma passed away. I went out to, to western Kansas. They, they lived in Colorado for a long time, and I went out to western Kansas where I have some family that I ne have never met, don't know them, but the family burial plot is, plot is there for my dad's family. And I'll never forget my aunt at that memorial service talking about how awesome it was that mom, grandma, was now laying next to her first husband, the father of her children. She, she had remarried after he had passed away. But my dad's dad was buried. My dad, my dad's dad, my grandpa is buried there. And there they, they placed my grandma. And just the thought of being, them being together again even today, we, we have this sense of like, I want to be buried in this family thing. Know that I'm going to be put to rest in my family. But yet, here on the side of the road, much like they would if one of the horses had died, much like they would have if one of just the servants maybe had just passed away, somebody unimportant, they just left them there by themselves marked with this stone. Because they were almost there. Not buried in the family cave, but on the side of the road. Almost there. The question has to be, what are your almost theirs? Just imagine Jacob's stress as he was pushing the family and maybe kicking himself for pushing and trying to go too far, almost there. What is it in our lives that we are almost there? Where, where are the areas of our lives that we're striving to get to? We're working hard, be it a, a promotion, working to support our family. Whatever it might be, fill in the blank. We know what our almost theirs are. 
what are our almost theirs? Because here is the truth. Here is the point of the day. Here is what this story, I believe, is all about. Because in that moment of failure, when Jacob was almost there, there was a promise. There was a promise. You see, this wasn't the first... Now, the Bible isn't clear about how much time there was that he was in Bethel, but while he was in Bethel, he was there to bury uh, a favorite care, like his nanny, essentially. You could almost think of it. His, his wife's caretaker, uh, whose name just slipped my mind. But he was there, buried her, set up pillars, and while he was there in Bethel, was reminded of the covenant, of the promise that from you will come this great nation. He's reminded of this and he sets up an altar and built, sets up these stones there in Bethel. And here he is a few days, a few weeks, a few months, it doesn't matter, later burying his wife on the side of the road, feeling maybe like a failure, questioning how God is this going to happen? How are you letting this happen to me? But here is the truth, what you see as failure might be a sign of God's promise. What you see as a failure might be a sign of God's promise in your life. If we just expect that God will work as he says he will, and God will work in our failures. What you see as failure might be a sign of promise. Now that's not some little feel good statement that we just crafted up this week. Let me show you how that came true. This was doing some of my rough math. This was probably around the year, sometime in the year 1800-ish BC. We're just gonna round it off, give or take a couple hundred years. Um, but we're just gonna say it's 1800 because it makes for easy math. The, Israelites spent 400 years in captivity. So we can knock off 400 years and say maybe the exodus happened around the year 1400 or so, give or take a couple hundred years. We know that they spent lots of time as the, in the land, the promised land, failing, repenting, failing, repenting, failing, repenting. And it was probably, man, my nose is itchy. Um, it was probably in the year about 586 BC or so when, when the Israelites were captured, finally captured as a result of their be behavior and taken into exile. So if you're tracking, which I hope you are, because suddenly it's, that's probably about 1,200 years from this story that we're looking at today of, of, Rachel, of Rachel and Benjamin and Jacob to the time when the Israelites are taken into exile. 1,200 years. God, God's time is not our time. That's right. God's time is not our time. So if the promise hasn't come true yet, don't worry, because this one wasn't quite seen for 1,200 years. The prophet Jeremiah if you want to, if you're following along in the paper Bible, Jeremiah's just past halfway. Um, open it up in the middle and you'll probably get the Psalms or Proverbs there and it's just a few books beyond that. Um, big book, you shouldn't be able to, should be easy to find. But Jeremiah chapter 35. Jeremiah chapter 35, there is a prophecy that reads like this. It says, the Lord, this is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah. Mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. When they were taken into exile, 1,200 years had passed. And Jeremiah is prophesying that when that happens, Rachel is going to be weeping because her children are no more. The children that she is the mother of, even though she only had two kids of Israel, she is kind of considered to be the mother of Israel. Even to this day, she is considered 
as Mama Rachel. And on that day, when the Israelites were taken captive, they were brought out of this road of Jerusalem. Past this, I'm sure now built up a little more, but this monument to the mother of Israel. 1,200 years on that lonely road where Rachel was buried all by herself, she stands as a monument, as a reminder of what God has promised to his people. Because as they're being in, taken into captivity, they walk past, this, walk past this and can be reminded that, wait a minute, God has been faithful in the past and I know he will be faithful in the future because the very next verse the Lord, this is what the Lord says, restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears for your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord. They will return from the land of the enemy. Amen. What you see as failure might be a sign of God's promise. Amen. Jacob was almost there but didn't make it, buried his wife on the side of the road. as a monument, as a reminder of the promise that God had made years before to Abraham. And God can, had made to Isaac and Jacob the promise that they were gonna be his people and that they were gonna be this great nation. It was a promise that they were gonna return. But not only that, it was a promise that there was still yet more to come. Because you see, this almost there didn't just stay an almost there. Because, and that's where the Christmas story kicks into this. In Micah, chapter five, verse two, there's a prophecy that talks about the chosen one, the savior, the Messiah, coming from the town of Bethlehem of Ephrath. I believe there, it's, they call it Ephratha, but we'll just call it Ephrath because I can say that easier. But this promise coming from Bethlehem, near the cave, almost there. And see, here's the important thing. Here's why Jacob didn't make it. Here's why we don't always make it with our almost theirs. Because you see, if Jacob had made it to Bethlehem, if the final child of the tribe of Israel had been born in Bethlehem, might they have looked to just an ordinary baby? Might they have looked to some human achievement that Jacob pressed on and in some glorious feet drove his team of horses and family into the town in the final moments just as the baby was born in Bethlehem of Ephrath. And they could look at this and say, Jacob did a great thing and we know that Benjamin was the one and we're following Benjamin. You see, they did not make it to Bethlehem because we can never make it there. It is Jesus who comes along and takes, it, takes us all the way. 1,700 years after Rachel is buried on the side of the road, another woman nearing labor is traveling maybe that same road. They may pass that very monument on their way to Bethlehem. Joseph is probably saying the same things Jacob was years and years before. Hang on, Mary, we're almost there. But you see, this was different because this was Jesus. And Jesus moves us past our failures. When we are with Jesus and when we are committed to to understanding what he does in our lives, he will move us past our failures. And at that moment, our failures will become not mere roadkill or signs of failure or just broken dreams. They will become monuments of promise, saying that God never called me to go all the way. God never said, you have to get there and I will be there waiting. No, Jesus said, I'm gonna walk that same lonely, broken road the boulevard of broken dreams. I'm gonna walk it with you. 
And when you couldn't make it all the way there, I will take you all the way there. The failures of Jacob that day and the courage he had to maybe do what God asked him and to bury his most beloved wife right there on the side of the road, to know that he wouldn't be laid to rest with her, to give up on maybe what his wants were, to give up on some of that and maybe being told by God, bury your wife here because for here is where she will be a reminder of the promise, of the covenant that I have, that I have made. Are almost theirs with Jesus. Are left in the dust. Are forgotten. And we're moved on. As Christians, and especially as Adventist Christians, we have an almost there. We've been looking forward to the second coming of Jesus. And sometimes it can get discouraging because it's like, why aren't we there yet? But it's not for us to worry about. We're almost there. And it's Jesus who has said, I've came once as a baby. I am coming again. So don't let the discouragements, the perceived failures get you down. Know that our failures might just be a sign of God's promise. A sign that God has said, I have come to make you new. I have to go back to my first slide because I forgot to put this verse in at the end. Oh, no, not that again, sorry. Okay, good. I couldn't think with him writhing in the background like that, being all excited about unwrapping himself. That's pretty cool. Um, But he said to me, this is Paul speaking in Corinthians, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. That's God talking. My my grace is sufficient for you. God's still talking. For my power, not Paul's or not ours, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In our weaknesses, the strength of Christ is made perfect. So when we are almost there, whenever we experience an almost there moment, know that it is a weakness that God can turn around if we allow him into a strength, into a moment when it can be a reminder to the people being exiled that, wait a minute, God has given you a promise, that it can be a reminder to Mary and Joseph 1,700 years later that, hey, while Israel was the chosen one, it wasn't the one. You are carrying the one. Our almost theirs, our weaknesses, by the grace of God, are made into strengths because of his power. That is hope for a world that needs a lot more hope. That is a promise of Christmas. That is what Christmas should remind us of. It's not humans trying to find a story that makes us feel good. It's a reminder. It's a reminder that God said, I have come to seek and save you because you're almost there. But you're almost there is miles away. It's not even in the same universe. But don't worry, I've got it covered. My power, my grace is sufficient for my power is made perfect in weakness. That is the promise that God offers us today. He promises 
to take our almost theirs and turn them into signs of hope, signs of joy, signs of, of contentment. Jesus, today, we stand here as a group of people. We're here today as the church, knowing that we are broken. But God, we, we ask you today to take our brokenness, our weakness, our almost theirs, and to move past them. God, what an amazing, amazing promise. What an amazing truth that you will make, take our weaknesses and use them for things that we could never imagine. So God, we thank you for that. We ask that we remember that at all time, that we expect to see you, not just at Christmas, and not just in the joy of family, friends, and presents, but in the times of struggle, in the times of loss and suffering. Lord, take our almost theirs and turn them into signs of your promise. We ask these things in the saving name of Jesus. Amen. We just want to thank you so much for joining us today and being a part of Grace Point Church. We would love to get to know you better, and we encourage you to check out our website, check out Facebook, Instagram, to find out more information. If there's anything that we can ever do for you, please let us know.